approach God's throne in a word of prayer this morning. Bow with me and let's pray to God. Father, we're so thankful to be here in this place. Father, for many months we were out of our sanctuary like many other churches. We were not able to gather together in person. And Father, that hinges on a lot of what's going on right now in the world as to whether or not we'll be able to do that in the future for a while. Father, we lift up prayers this morning against the virus as it's spreading across our nation, it seems, as we turn on the TV, the radio in our cars, pick up the newspapers, we see stories about hot spots and how the virus is coming back, and many of us, Father, are now hearing of more people that we actually know who have been diagnosed with it. So, Father, the only thing we can do, as you have asked us to do, is simply pray we ask you, Father, to be with each one who is studying this virus, all of the scientists and the doctors. Ask them, Father, to seek deep within their hearts, to draw upon all the knowledge that you've given them. Help them, Father, to find a cure, or a vaccine at least, Father, in all things according to your holy will. We ask, Father, for those who have been diagnosed with the virus, that, Father, you keep them healthy and safe. Help them to return and be restored into full health. Father, for the many other things that are going on in our world right now surrounding race and classism and, and Father, all of the different things that are happening around us that are so discouraging, we pray your mighty hand to reach down and to intervene in people's hearts. Help us, Lord, just to realize that we need to be kind to everyone. Father, no matter where, where our background is or what we look like or where we come from, simply to be kind. You've asked us in your word to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to do that, Father. We thank you again for this time, for each one who's come out to be here this morning. We pray that you bless the service as it speaks to each one. We pray for our service tonight, Father, uh, as we gather together with the other churches in the community outside to have a time of fellowship and singing. Father, for those who will be able to come back, we ask, Lord, that you uh, bless their travels. And, Father, keep the heat down to a minimum, Lord, and help folks to be comfortable and to enjoy their time this evening. And Father, in all of these things and so much more that escapes our hearts and our minds, we say thank you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Please be seated. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching up to heaven. And the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you'll spread out to the west and the east, the north and the south, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, and your offspring. I'm with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. And now reading from the book of Psalm, 139 is the chapter, and verses 1 through 11. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down, and you're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there too. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, or if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. And then this morning's reading from the epistle of Romans, 
chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit, and we're God's children. And now if we're God's children, then we're His heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hopes that the creation itself would be liberated from bondage, to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption to sonship, the redeem, redemption of our bodies, and is hope we were saved. And by that hope is seen that no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? For if we hope what we do not yet have, we wait patiently for it. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of prayer, as we remember those who were mentioned and who are in print on our prayer list there, is going to be No, Not One, hymn number 544. I'll ask you to stand as you're able as you let the words of this song speak to our heart.
opportunity to be here in your house. We thank you for the prayers that have been offered up thus far, for the songs that have been sung. We pray, Father, for the words of these hymns as they speak to our heart. We pray for the word that has gone forth and how it has fallen on that good and fertile soil, we pray, as we spoke about in the message last week. We pray, Father, that as we go out into the world this week, we might be a blessing to someone, that we might be able to encourage them in this time of despair. We pray, Father, for each one who's gathered here this morning for any needs that they might have that went unmentioned, Father. Sometimes things that are going on in our lives are just too painful to share for whatever reason, but we know that you know all. And so, Father, we simply ask, simply ask you to seek in our hearts those things that are there, Father, deal with them in your own will, in your own way. We pray for those who are working this day, for those who are traveling, for those who are on beds of sickness. We pray for our doctors, our uh, firefighters, our police and EMT. We ask, Lord, that you keep them all safe. We pray that you do with the nurses and the caregivers in the nursing homes as they're dealing with this virus in a major way as well. And so, Father, just be with us all and help us to feel uh, your presence among us on a day-to-day -day basis and, and keep us encouraged as we go through these troubling times. We pray all of these things in Jesus' most precious and loving name. Amen. We thank the Lord for our tithes and offerings today, and with that we'll praise Him through the doxology.
assembled that was given to us by Christ himself that was the represented by the be broken, tortured, and finally killed upon that cross of Calvary for our salvation and the salvation for all who would believe.
weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner of servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because when you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat, bring it into my barn. Picking up now at verse number 36 in the same chapter. Then he left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
These are questions we're asked every day in many ways, culturally, here in the South anyway. Uh, we are asked, who are your people? I was I always asked, were you Don Geyser's boy? You know, they'd see the resemblance or whatever. Rodney and I, we've joked about this before a lot too, you know, he said, who are your people? That's an essential question you ask when you're in the South. You want to know who, who they are, who their kinfolk are. When you're new in town or, you know, if you got a new boy or girlfriend shows up at the house, but who are your people? Think about it. We ask this type of question so many different ways of just about everybody we meet. It's become a habit. We assume that this person we're talking to has a family. They have a place to belong. Uh, you know, to talk about at least, and, you know, have childhood memories. We're often taken aback before we don't know really what to say if somebody says, well, I don't know, I was brought up in foster family. I was brought up in foster care. Or if they say, my family just doesn't care about me anymore. They kicked me out a long time ago. I just got out of drug rehab or alcohol rehab and my family's kind of disowned me. If we're caring people, we feel for people who find themselves adrift in life like that uh, or alone for whatever reason. Because to us, that sense of belonging is so near and so dear. We have people that love us and care about us. You remember the old song, um, gosh, I forgot who sang it. Uh, people who need people. Uh, they're the luckiest people. They, I seem to remember Molly singing it on Jerry Lewis' telephone for some reason every year they would sing that one. So, you know, if we're the luckiest people, if we're honest, though, haven't we each had a time maybe in our life, if not your whole life, when you've kind of felt abandoned by at least some of your family, or some have turned their back on you, maybe cut off for a while, or friends, if not family? What happens to us when all we see or feel is that aloneness or that darkness, you know, in your life? What happens to your sense of self if you feel like that darkness might be part of your own fault? What happens when it is our own fault because of bad decisions that we made and people have cut ties with us? Maybe it's through sin or maybe it's through selfishness. There's nobody there to reach out to. And that's a terrible place to be in. Have you ever felt that way? It's really hard. So what do we do? What do we do? Some despair. Other people get themselves wrapped up in anger. Uh, other people hang in there with hope. So how do we choose what to do? How do we make our decisions? Lots of questions. Lots of questions. And these questions might be overwhelming. Now, they might be questions that none of us have ever asked of ourselves either. Uh, but they do make us think about what could be difficult days in our life. Are they unanswerable questions? No, not at all. Because of all our readings today from the Scripture that we've read up to this point, they have given us a reason to hope. All of our readings that we read today talk about relationships with others, even when we're not kin. And the Psalms that I just sang, they talk about that as well. Being part of a family is what each one of those readings and Psalms is about today. God's family. God's family. Paul gives a wonderful definition of how we belong to God's family. He says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then we're heirs. And then if we're heirs, we're not only heirs to God, but we're joint heirs with His Son, Jesus Christ, the very one that He sent to die for our sin debt. We may suffer with Him so that we also may be glorified with Him. And we get to call God that Greek word Abba. Abba Father is like an adopted father. So I've heard people say before, I like it, um, if you're adopted, you know, your family chose you. Sometimes you're stuck with what you get with a real family, right? But if you're adopted, your family saw you, wanted you, and chose you. Now, I've never adopted a child, but I've, been, I've adopted several dogs and cats from the, from the animal shelter. And it's just something how you always knew which was the right one. At least I did. You'd walk through and one of them would pay special attention to you. Or they'd reach the paw as far as they could out of the cage. You're like, oh, I can't go on now without that one. So you knew which one it was. You absolutely did. So God adopted us. He saw us. He made us. He created us. He knew us. And He said, I want you. But then we often turn on the flip side of the coin and wonder about suffering, don't we? We wonder when people get sick or we see that people's suffering is not of their own doing. We hear things said like, and people mean well when they say these things. People say, well, God never gives you more than you can handle. Or this suffering is going to make you stronger. 
But think about how some folks react to suffering they think is brought on by a person's bad life choices. A homeless person asks for some change. Or a single mother with children is getting welfare. I've heard people roll down the windows and yell, get a job, at people like that. Maybe a young man who's ju just got out of jail, just released out the door, he doesn't know where to go get a job. A lot of people won't hire you if you've, if you've got a record, a criminal record, so he doesn't know what to do, and he feels despair. But you know what? Sometimes as human beings, we're not that compassionate, even as God's people. We'll step back sometimes and say, well, that's their problem. You know, if they shouldn't have done what they did, then they wouldn't have got what they got. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I have. It's their own fault. Or they're lazy. My hard-earned taxes is paying for them. They've been supporting them and their welfare, and that bum in jail getting three meals and cable TV. These are all phrases I've heard in the last week, mind you. I didn't have to dig far to do this sermon. If we're really honest about it, it's hard to imagine a loving God living in us, calling us His children, His adopted family, and yet deliberately giving us something to suffer in order to test us or make us stronger. If we're honest about it, the homeless and the poor and those who've made bad choices, aren't they still the children of God? Amen. Our brothers and our sisters, that we must be willing to love and help and reach out to them as we are able and teach them, if it is due to choices they're making, to teach them a better way as we help them. What Paul shares with us is that God is with every one of us through whatever happens in our human lives. Whether we acknowledge God's presence or not, Thomas Keating in his teachings on centering prayer says that God is present no matter what and He waits for us to say yes to His presence. God is very patient. He'll wait for a long, long time. He's a very loving God. Now, we might be thinking this all sounds too easy. We don't have to worry about anything but knowing God's Spirit is within us and we're all set. I'm going to heaven, okay? Of course, we know that. The wonderful symbolism found in Jacob's dream that we read about in Genesis gives us a place to start thinking about our responsibility as children of God. He dreamed there was a ladder set up. And on that ladder on earth, the top of it reached to heaven. And the angels of God were on it as he dreamed, ascending up and down and up and down. What a wonderful dream. Jacob realizes what a powerful message that was, so he set up a pillar on an altar from the rock that he had his head laying on, poured some oil on it, and gave it a name, named it Bethel, setting that place aside as a holy place. Jacob received in his own message from God in that dream the promise of a family that would reach far and wide, a connection between heaven and earth that God was making. And down through the generations even, the promise of family was as important back then thousands of years ago as it is right now today. We're also offered a message in this reading. That ladder connecting heaven and earth, that's there for us. And those angels going up and down, they're connecting humanity to God's heaven. So we, who say we're Jesus' followers, we have to be like those angels. We have to be a part of that connection. We have to be a link in that chain of making that connection, connecting the world with heaven by the way that you and I live our lives and to make sure that we are who we say we are and that people see that in us. Now, that sounds like work, doesn't it? And of course it is. Being human and living in a human world is going to have its hard days, sometimes lots of them. More, it seems, for others sometimes. And if we're serious about claiming to be a Christian, then we have to accept that angelic role, though. What it means for us is that it, what sounds like work, let's change that with another word, it's actually our ministry. It's your and my ministry to our Father God to do this, to be that connection. Each one of us in this room, everyone, if we had time to go around and, and, and just talk to everybody here, as small as our, small -ish as our crowd is this morning, uh, every one of you has been given a talent by God. You may not think so. My grandmother, she used to say, she's like, I can't do anything. The preacher preach a series on your spiritual talent. She's like, I can't do any of that. She, you know, she's like, and the preacher thought her one time, heard, heard her saying that after one of those series of sermons. And he said, Miss Dawson, he said, you are one of the best cooks I have ever seen. 
And she said, well, he'd been on dinner for several times at the house. And she said, well, thank you. And he said, that's one of your gifts. You don't get what I'm trying to tell you. He said, when you are given a gift and you're able, if that's all you're able to do even, is cook or bake or whatever, he said, then do that for God. Cook a meal for a family in need or something. So you know from that point on, when something would happen within the church and food was needed, my grandmother would fire up the stove. And she started to see that as her ministry, as her vision of being able to help others. She didn't. She couldn't sing in the choir, or play, couldn't carry a tune in the bucket, but she she could cook. Okay. Some people have various different. I'll have to get back into one of those series again before long. But you have a talent. Trust me. You have a spiritual gift that God has given you. Maybe you may not have brought it to the surface yet, but you've got it. And what God does is He calls on us to use that talent, that spiritual gift that personal ability that you have to travel up and down that figurative ladder we're talking about and connecting the world to God. That's how you have your role in that. Treating every person like the loved child of God that he or she is. For some, doing missionary work is their gift. For some, it might be sharing a talent, offering hope, singing in the choir, playing an instrument, maybe praying in the church, maybe teaching a Sunday school class, maybe baking, maybe writing letters, maybe you've got a way with words and writing letters or typing and sending emails to make the church people feel connected. Maybe that's your gift in your ministry. There are certainly millions of ways. Each way is pleasing to the God who lives within us. So hard work or easy work, either one, whatever our gift or whatever your own suffering may be, we can be sure of one thing, though, and that is that we are never alone. God's promise is all throughout that Old and New Testament, but it can easily be described in Jacob's dream. It's especially lovely. He says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that of which I have spoken to you. God says, When I make a promise to you, He says, I will not leave you until I see it through in you. So he'll give us the backup. He'll give us every tool we need. He'll give us the strength we need when we get weary. God will do all of that for you. We might look at that land God promises us as eternal life, but here God promises to be with us and keep us until that day. He promises to stay with us until we reach that final run in the ladder once we ascend one, more, one last time and get to eternity. That's God's promise and a source of strength for us that's just as awesome as Jacob's dream was thousands of years ago. As I close, I'll say this. We're all very fortunate because when somebody asks us about our family, we can all say this at least. My family is all of God's people. And we have promise that we will never be left alone by Him. So the next time somebody asks you, say, Who's, who's boy or whose girl are you? You can say, I'm God's. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Please join your hearts with me in the prayers that we now offer. Gracious God, we thank you for being our Father, for instilling in us a sense of family in our Christian faith. You teach us in your word that we're all created in your image. So when we come to you, we come as joint heirs of your Son, Christ that we're all brothers and sisters down here, and that we all have to look out for one another. Thank you for adopting us, as we are, faults and all. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. As you call on us to do daily, we pray for the needs of others. So many around us are hurting. So many have basic needs, just of health care, the ability to go to a doctor or a dentist, to have a sore tooth pulled, or have a necessary surgery or to get some medicines that will help them. So many people need that and don't have that. Father, many people need food around this world. Many need clean drinking water. Some are forced to drink water that actually makes them sick and sicker, but it's all they have. Father, some people need clothing, using simply as we hearken in our minds back to Adam and Eve's time, using leaves off the trees for clothes in some parts of the world. Some people need shelter. Sometimes they have to build several shelters in a period of weeks because the previous one was destroyed by rain or by wind. They, don't, they could never imagine living in a, a beautiful home like we do with central heating and air and electricity when you flip a switch. Many people need safety. 
Many people in our world live in areas where gangs run rampant and they simply break into the houses and take the women and the children and kill those who are left behind. Father, many people need justice. Many people are wrongly accused around the world. Many people are fighting to get out of jail for something they didn't do. Father, we pray for all of those who are dealing with issues like that this day. And thank you for those organizations that are out there that we support many of them who are trying to help with that. We pray for those who are dealing with anxiety and depression during this pandemic and many day-to-day -day life problems are exacerbated by everything that's going on in the world. We simply ask your guidance through it all. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we pray for those who are on our prayer list and those that are even unknown to us right now. We pray for those who are on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers, our public safety people, and Father, the scientists especially, again, we pray for us. They are seeking to find a cure or a vaccine for coronavirus. Keep us all safe and healthy in the week ahead and bring us back at our next appointed service time. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Father, we pray for our world. Look in mercy upon all the nations and Help us to get along in a spirit of unity and cooperation, realizing that we're all family members. We're all human beings. We were all created by you. And we are worthy of compassion and love. We pray especially for our local community here. We've read in the papers all this week about tempers flaring and shootings happening almost nightly. Intervene, O oh God, and bring about a spirit of peace and love. We pray for all of our leaders, whether we agree with them or not. Father, we lift them up to you in prayer and ask you to help them to make right decisions and to seek your face in all of the things that they decide that affect us all. We pray today for Donald, our president, our senators and representatives in Congress, Ralph, our governor, Bradley, our mayor, and our town council members here in Fenton. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for your church on earth. Give us daily strength and courage. Help us to embrace the life of service that you've called each of us to, that we might wake daily and before we put our feet on the floor to know and to do your will, loving and serving the world. Remember especially Terry, who's our general minister and president, Bill, our regional minister, all of our deacons, deaconesses, and elders here at First Church, and all of our members and friends who carry forth your joyful word. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Indeed, we ask that you hold all of us close this day and every day. And we lift our prayers in the name of Christ, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is To Us All and To Every Nation. Number 634, please stand as you're able and sing in your heart.
you can join us tonight, please do know that we'll start the service at 6 o'clock and we'll dismiss just as soon as we can so that the heat won't be too overbearing. I think it's going to be hot tonight, so again, make your own best judgment tonight about that. Uh, let's respond with our commissioning statement and then I'll give our benediction and we'll retire to our homes. God bless you and thank you again. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Love you all.